Well, Jay, you know, when I was a kid, I loved mysteries and I would read all these books on UFOs and Bigfoot and how they built Stonehenge <laughs> and all this stuff. And now that I'm an adult, I know what a real mystery is. And the mystery <laughs> is the algorithm. And yeah. oh my God, everybody talks about the algorithm. Like everybody. they know what like they know what's in it. You know, exactly. and, and as Glenn uh, points out to us, there is no algorithm. There's a lot of algorithms. Yes, exactly. We were so blessed that he would sit down with us and hang out and chat and talk about his new book. And it, it was just such a treat. And we yeah. were so excited to, to actually put it down now and put it out there to the world. It was wonderful. Yeah, we really enjoy talking with Glenn. Um, he's such a smart guy, and he built one of our favorite websites, everynoise.com. And, and we talk about that a little bit. I think he mentioned there was like over 6,000 genres in uh, everynoise.com. But I just want to read you one quick small paragraph from the back of the book, and then we'll let this thing roll. Um, on the back of his book, it says, For the first time in history, almost every song ever recorded is available instantly everywhere. This book charts what music's dazzling digital revolution really means for fans and artists. As a former data guru at the world's biggest streaming service, Spotify, Glenn McDonald reveals what the tech giants know about you, what they serve or how they serve up your next song, whether fans can cheat the algorithm, and we talk about that with him, whether jazz is dead, right, and your chances of becoming a rock star. So now without further ado, uh, here's our special four-year anniversary bonus episode with uh, former Spotify data alchemist Glenn McDonald. Let it roll. Stand by for transmission. This is London calling. Wake up! The revolution is at hand! Your morning coffee is on the air. On the air. On the air. Your morning coffee, the weekly music news for the new music business. It's the highly curated, agitated, advocated, moderated, and liberated digital music information that you need to know. We are your digital music authority. And now, from our studios in Hollywood, California, here's your hosts, Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Great. Um, you have this great new book out? Um, it's called, you have not yet heard your favorite song. Uh, I've, uh, I've read it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really fun read. It's a little snarky in parts, a little funny in parts. It's not just, a uh, a book about algorithms or data. So congratulations on the book. Thank you. So let's kick it off. Almost everyone that I meet in the music business, and this has been going on for years, they seem to be an expert in Spotify's algorithm. <laughs> it's like publicists, radio promotion people, artist managers, they, you know, they tell me this is what's in, you know, this is what you have to do for the, uh, for the algorithm. You know, skips are bad, of course, you know, ads to personal libraries are good. But, uh, you know, they talk about how often you should release tracks and how long, you know, a, a song's intro should be. You were one of the architects of the Spotify algorithms, uh, plural. Um, so tell us a little bit about what they do and what they don't do. Well, they're very much plural. And so there's a lot of answers to that question, depending <laughs> on what we're talking about in there. I'm sure they all change. They all change over time. And um, probably some of them have changed since I left Spotify back in December. The, the thing they pretty much all have in common is they start with the body of human listening. Like all the input really is 
there are five or 600 million people and they're listening to music all the time. And that's a lot of data. And the, my official job description in the Spotify HR system was to experiment with what it's possible to do with all that data. And the techniques run a wide range of degrees of, of technical sophistication. If you're, if you're feeling positive about it or complexity, if you're maybe feeling a little bit more skeptical. So at one end, there's just math, like counting and math are very, very powerful. And, you know, the simplest charts are the simplest kind of data analysis where you just count up the streams or count up the listeners and and then put things in order. But you can do a lot more with not a lot more complicated math than that. So a lot of what I did was just like count and then divide by something. And so if you look at how popular something is in a place, then you get a chart. But if you compare that to how popular everything else is in that place and how popular those things are everywhere else, then you get a different kind of chart. And if... You take that same technique and you apply it not to places, but to genre audiences or to demographic slices or to time, then you get a whole bunch of very different analyses from basically the same family of techniques. And then if you get fancier, you can do what's called embedding, where you turn each pattern of listening into a bunch of abstract numbers. So you make a sort of computational space out of them. So imagine taking all the songs on Spotify and like represent them as a penny and dump all the pennies on a table. And then you try to spread them out on the table according to different ways people interact with those pennies. So all the pennies that people save, like you push over towards the left side and the pennies people spend towards the right side, the pennies that they spend on cigarettes, you like you spend push those in the top right and then the things you spend on other things you do something else with and that's a very powerful technique and it works really well for the biggest groups of things uh, but at, at some point you're like here's there's like this penny that people use to flip a coin to determine what to order for lunch and there's only one of those and then there's one penny that someone bet on a football game and they bet one penny and you can't really, and there's not enough room on the table to make a separate pile of the pennies people bet on football games and the pennies people flip to decide what to have for lunch. So you're just like, Oh, all right, we'll just make another, we'll make a pile of pennies that are just the miscellaneous things. So if you want the pennies that are like the pennies people spent on cigarettes or a lot of those works really well. If you want the pennies people bet on football games, then you probably get a bunch of weird stuff that people like these are pennies that people bet but not on football games these are people pennies people lost while they were attending football games yeah it gets it gets weird so something so discover weekly is the the you know some most popular example of something that's based on embeddings and it kind of has this property if you like the kind of stuff that lots of other people like and in the particular case of Discover Weekly, it's not just listening, but playlist making. So if you like the kind of thing that lots of people make playlists about, very focused playlists, then Discover Weekly probably works great for you. If you like a bunch of different things and they're not as well served by playlist making, then you may get, not only may you not get as good results, but you might get things that you don't listen to at all but that sort of fall into the gaps between the things that you listen to. And all these techniques have their, the things they're good at and the things that they're not so good at. And it's really a task for the product managers and the designers and the engineers to figure out how to use them for the things that they're good at to give good results of something. And then for the other things, use something else. Well, see, so you write in the book how algorithms fail, so, you know, you're kind of touching on a little bit of that, but talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's sort of like talking about how hammers fail and hammers do a really bad job at screwing in screws. It's like you're using the wrong tool. Now you tell and, me. And, you know, it's <laughs> uh, right. And it, 
it's sort of petty to, to fault the hammer for that. Um, but if, if you explain to someone that you have a problem involving a screw that needs to be screwed in and they give you a hammer and say, I made this tool for you and you use it and it doesn't work, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's sort of on you because it's a hammer and you can tell it's not going to work. But it, when, when they get more complicated and you can't tell from looking at it what it's going to do, then it's sort of on the people giving you the tool to have given you a better tool. And in the music world, algorithms fail for a lot of reasons. Like bad data is really the most common reason. Like if you get, if you go to your release radar this week and you're, you love some band called Options and you're like, oh my God, there's a new Options song? I didn't know. Like I thought those guys broke up in, in, in Kansas City in 2012. And then you play it and it's some you know rapper from Bulgaria named Options. And you go look and they're on the same page. The release radar algorithm has done exactly the right thing, which is you like this band. There's a new song on that band's page you probably want to know about it. A different algorithm that was trying to figure out which page, which artist named options that song is by has screwed up. And then the, you know, the next one that's just trying to show you stuff in a very simple way is stuck with bad data and there's nothing it can do about it. And then more complicated ways in which algorithms fail, but the, the simple ones predominate by far. Yeah, you talk about release radar. You know, let's talk about source of stream for a minute. I'm currently tracking about 20 artists or so in Spotify for artists, and roughly on average, about a quarter of their Spotify streams are coming from Release Radar, Discover Weekly, Radio. Those three sources are really good at recommending things, at least for me. Um, how do those work? Yeah, so their radio is complicated. And probably even more complicated than when I left. So it's hard to say that that probably has a lot of factors going into it. But Discover Weekly and the portion of Release Radar when it runs out of your artists, those two work the same way we're talking about with embeddings. So they're sort of trying to sort the world into very approximate relationships and then give you stuff that's near a representation of you, but that representation of you is averaged over all your tastes. So it will be super effective if you have one very specific taste and nothing else, and it will get less effective if you have various tastes. So for me, who listens to a lot of things, it tends to be pretty noisy. Whereas if you're if you're like a trance fan and all you listen to is trance, it's probably going to do a great job of finding you more trans, unless the trans is mislabeled. Got it. <laughs> so in your book, uh, Glenn, you teach or you touch on the evolution of streaming. Talk about the roles uh, mixtapes, burning CDs, and YouTube had on that evolution. Yeah, I mean, I think it, playlists are obviously the evolution of mixtapes and, and mixed CDs. And also sort of in a way, an evolution of personics and like these other early methods that, that people had and compilations. Like pe- the industry always wanted, even in the, in the old album centric days, to be able to sell individual songs to people who weren't willing to buy those albums. And then people wanted to share music in ways that was also not always aligned with how the albums are. And mixtapes, you know, obviously were a you know a huge emotional part of a lot of people's lives, but were a fairly small part of both the music business and the music sharing social economy. Because it was hard. You had to have the right equipment to be able to bounce stuff between things and like get your levels right and figure out how many songs were going to fit on the side of a cassette. And oh, did you set the like the right kind of cassette? Is it metal or chrome or like did you pick one that re- sounds good? Um, so from that point of view, in terms of the the ability to share music, playlists are a huge step forward. The current state of playlists in 
all the playlists, you know, all the services is embarrassingly poor in terms of what you can express on top of just these are songs in order. So if you made a mixtape, like you could draw on the cassette label, you could put notes on it, you could like really express why it was that you had picked these songs for this context. It's insane to me that we're 12, 15, whatever years into the streaming era. And it's not like just straight entry stakes that you ought to be able to comment on songs in playlists as you make them. But, but I guess here we are, the, the, the economic value of that, apparently empirically is low. Um, but I still, I still keep hoping that one of the services will just say, all right, look, we're going to make it so playlists can be really personal and really excellent. And then everybody else will have to follow along for, for feature parody. But right now we've got descriptions at the top and that's about it. Yeah. In the book, you talk about previewability um, and the music industry really didn't embrace previewability outside of radio in any meaningful way until iTunes sort of showed up. Uh, you know, there were listening booths uh, in the 60s and CD listening stations at record stores in the 90s. But how has streaming previewability changed our discovery and listening habits? Yeah, I mean, I, I spent years writing a music review column in the era where it really felt like part of my responsibility as someone writing about music was to describe the music to people because they weren't going to be able to hear it often until they bought it. And that that's weird. I, at the time, it seemed, it just seemed normal because we were used to it. But in retrospect, I, could th- I think we can say that it was weird and not that helpful. And reading descriptions of music is... It's like an interesting pastime on its own, as is writing them, but it, it it's nothing compared to just playing the song and being like, "Oh, I now I understand what what that guy was describing," and I would have described it a different way, but at least now I know what this song sounds like. And yeah, previewability assumed this shopping experience where your task, you know, there was this big barrier. There are things for sale. And you had to buy them, and then you got to listen to them for real. And so all these things like previews and, and reviews and, and album art, in, in essence, are, were little bridges over that arbitrary gap, like ways to tempt you into buying the thing so that you could listen to it. And from a business point of view, that like the buying was the goal. From the music's point of view, the listening was the goal. And what we get from streaming is it's a listening ex- exploration itself is a listening experience. Now you don't have to buy things. You don't have to shop. You don't have to think about your dis- making decisions about what you're going to listen to ahead of time. You can just listen and make your, all your decisions afterwards. Like you play it, you don't like it, delete it or move on from a, for, as a music listener, I think that's, you know, a, a quantum leap better. I think as a music maker, it's also a quantum leap better because trying to convince someone that they should want to listen to your music is pretty hard. And getting them to actually try it because it's free, both in effort and in, in money, and maybe liking it, I think that's a much more viable premise for, especially for artists who are not already famous and whose songs are not going to be in people's ambient environment already. So as we are 12, 15 years into streaming now, what do streaming services truly know about me besides that I have impeccable music taste? (laughs) I mean... (laughs) You might as well just check a box when you sign up. That's right. Exactly. Impeccable music taste? Yes, yes. Um, they, they know very little about you, really. They, I mean, when you sign up for Spotify, you, you have to tell them what country you're in because laws. And they will ask you how old you are. I guess you have to answer the question about how old you are. But I know from looking at the data that 
people don't always answer that question factually. And, and they ask you what gender you are, but you don't even have to answer. Um, so that's, that's pretty much what they know about you. And they also know not where you are, because there's no location tracking, but they know where your song requests get to them from. And often that's enough to know pretty well where you are. Like if you're on, on a desktop computer and like home wired cable internet or something, then the servers that signal goes through are well-known servers. They're in particular places. They probably have a, a notion of where you are down to a few miles. If you're on your phone, the, the, Streaming service may only know where the cell phone hub is that your request is reaching them from. So I've d- I did this experiment because I could I could look at the tracking on the Spotify side. So I would sit at my desk and play something from my desktop, and I'd see that I was registered as being in Cambridge, which is in fact where I live. And then I'd flip over and play the same song on my phone, and it would say I was in New Jersey because AT and T going through some big hub in New Jersey. And and if I turned around and did the analysis on all the data, I could see this very clearly. I could see places in that reporting that were you know, six, 80% mobile phones, 20% desktop, like a normal distribution. And then there'd be places that everyone streaming from there was streaming on a desktop. And there'd be places where everyone streaming there was streaming on a phone. And like, Either that is a very weird thing in society or it's a glitch in technology. And usually when that's what you find yourself wondering, that the answer is it's a glitch in technology. So, which was funny because I was trying to analyze like what was popular in different towns and there'd be these towns where I'm like, what is that town? I've never heard of that town and it's supposedly like 80 miles from where I grew up. What is it? And I'd go research and... Oh, there's a you know cell phone hub there, or there's an Amazon data warehouse there. Like, there's some reason in the topology of computers why there's a lot of signals coming from there. But it's not that people live there, and it's not that they go there for lunch and they listen to music over lunch. It's just anomalies, and then I had to try to deal with those anomalies. Does Spotify care where? a song came from, whether it was a major or an indie, does, does that matter? It mostly doesn't. Uh, in 12 years of, of working on algorithms that did recommendations, I never saw that bit in the data that led to the recommendations ever. And the only time I ever dealt with it was when I got curious and like wanted to make a dashboard to answer that question. Like is radio disproportionately major label compared to organic streaming? I I could, I could go find out, but it it was never part of the actual equation. Uh, Plenty of other things are though. And I mean, this is sort of the thing I say in the book about major labels is we've got to the point where, you don't have to go through a major label to get onto Spotify and listeners don't have to go through and to choose what they listen to on Spotify. So there's, there's no inherent reason why an unknown rapper's song could get a billion streams tomorrow, just the same as whatever Drake did last. But, in, but there's like a gajillion social reasons why that's almost certainly not going to happen. Like the, no one knows about that song. All the methods they have of learning about that song in the attention economy, which is you know different from the the monetary economy, are still pretty much monopolized by major labels. They're the ones with marketing budgets. They're the ones who are probably going to get their songs on commercials and in movies and on TV shows for the same you know industry reasons. So probably the music that you're going to know to look for is major label music because of all these other factors. That is gradually becoming less true. And I think every once in a while, Spotify puts out some 
clearly self-serving statistic about what percentage of something is is indie. And if that number is ever large, then you you are well advised to ask questions about the methodology and ask what definition of, of indie was being used and note that they probably didn't tell you. And so a lot of that nominal indie music is on a distribution company owned by a major label. It's, you know, it's, it's true. It's not an artist who got, you know, signed to Def Jam, but it's not an unknown artist that is totally outside of all aspects of the, of the conventional music industry. But even if you do a principled definition of what indie is, the balance of power is slowly shifting away from the major labels or, you know, away from the, the major divisions within the major labels and towards the partially owned distributors and towards the indie distributors and towards actual indie artists far down the pyramid. Interesting. Um, you know, Jay and I both started our careers as musicians and also worked with artists who span an inordinate amount of time when they're finishing an album, you know, putting it in the order that made sense to them. But do we now, is it a fully track based world or are there still fans that listen to full albums in that intended order? I wondered this too. It's Spotify and, uh, and the answer in statistics was yes, there's absolutely still album listeners The people like that's the way they listen. I actually, I did a thing at one point that calculated for every listener on Spotify, whether they were a playlist listener or an album listener. And there were, there are some other categories, but basically those were the, those are the two that, that vastly dominate. And it's true. There's, there's a lot of playlist listeners. I mean, it's more of them than anything else, but I think they're not, they're not really replacing album listeners. They're replacing radio listeners. And so plenty of people who think of themselves as album listeners, if you like really start questioning them, what you realize is they're album listeners when they're in control of their listening, but they spend a ton of time listening to the radio in the car or something else so their full music life is heavily song oriented including the parts they don't control when they're like in a store or on the street and and hearing music that's definitely not whole albums at a time but then they make their own decisions like all right i like that song now i will listen to that album and there's a little age correlation to that like definitely older listeners listen to albums more um, but it, but the difference in age is pretty low. Like the 60 year olds listen to a small percentage more albums than the 20 year olds. And I, I actually had specific stats for this in the book, um, that Spotify lawyers made me take out and like, what, why are you, why are you arguing about this? Like, this is not, it's not controversial. It doesn't make you look bad. It's just interesting. But they're like, it's insider information. I'm like, well, yep, you got me there. It's definitely insider information. So, okay, I'll, I'll take it out. I, it wasn't that interesting, I guess. But, but yeah, the album's not dead. And I think, I think from the artistic point of view, it's good that you don't have to make albums or put your energy into albums unless you actually want to. In the CD era... Everything was albums, and it was the golden age of making people pay $15 for one song that they want. And that was annoying for for consumers, for listeners. But I think it was also kind of bad for artists, too, because it sort of blurred the distinction between albums as sales packages and albums as art. And now, if you don't want to make albums as art... You don't have to make them as sales packages either. So that allows the albums that really are artistic forms and are supposed to be listened to as a whole to just like, those are the ones you can care about now. Singles bundled together, whatever. And you can totally tell this when you look at an album on Spotify on the desktop, because you can see the stream counts. And so any album that's just a collection of hits 
you can just look at the counts and see exactly where the album tracks that weren't singles are because their stream counts are like a hundredth of the singles. And if it's a real album, then pretty much the numbers go down a little bit, but, but in a straight, obvious pattern and they get to the end and they're like 80% of what they were at the top. And you can basically measure this, the, how, how much people listen to the whole album by the slope of that, you know, number curve. And so you can see that some people make albums and people don't always make it to the end. It's kind of, it's kind of brutal um, seeing all those, all those numbers in public, but, but that's it. Yeah. Super interesting. You know, we had Jen Mosse on the podcast to talk about people attempting to game the system with bots and spin farms, for example, to inflate stream counts. How can you tell when streams are probably not coming from a real person? This this was this would have been the geekiest chapter of the book, but I knew from the beginning that I wasn't gonna be able to get away with this level of detail. But I I would at some point, I'd love. I, I'll probably, everybody probably lost interest by then, but it would have been fun to write write up like every technique that I used to find artificial streaming, and probably it would have bored everybody. And my editor would have made it, made me take it out, even if I'd written it. But it, there were there were dozens of them. Like I had just like layers and layers and layers of very specific filters because every kind of anomaly is pretty easy to find and it's very hard to do anything that in artificial streaming that's not just trivially detectable it's hard to attribute fraud like it's hard to know who bought these streams and in terms of you know punishment or accountability that's a critical question but in terms of just realizing this song has been boosted i'm going to take those streams out that's really easy because if you artificial patterns are artificial, like the whole point of artificial streaming is to produce an effect that the humans are not producing. And when you do that, you do it in a not human way and it's painfully obvious. And the, I mean, the, the OG fraud technique was just a lot of free accounts and so the original anti-fraud algorithm was just measuring the percent of a song streams that came from free accounts. And if it got much higher than the percentage of free accounts, that was, that was pretty bad. Mm. Uh, and it got, it got more complicated after that. But, but yeah, finding, finding is easy. I, the thing I say is I've spent, if there was a life of crime I was going to adopt, streaming fraud is clearly far and away the one I am best prepared to enter, and I would not do it. Like I would take up, you know, shoplifting or something. <laughs> I I could make more money shoplifting. I feel confident than than I could make doing artificial streaming because it it's just it's so obvious. It's so trivially cut off, and. And it's so slow to make money. Like a third of a cent a stream is that that's a slow that's a fast way to make money if you are Drake and you have a billion fans. If you are a fake artist and you're trying to orchestrate fake streams, you gotta orchestrate so many fake streams to make anything. It's just it's not and if you have to pay for servers to run those fake streams on, you're probably losing money. I think the only people making money, this is a sad comment on society and it applies to a lot of things, but the only people making money on artificial streaming are the ones selling artificial streaming tools to people who think they're going to make money from artificial streaming. But it's only the, only the people selling the tools are making any money. It's like gold mining. Like You could make money selling shovels predictably. You couldn't make money finding gold predictably. Some, somebody did, but you, like... You'd have to get really lucky. Both Jay and I were working in the business back in 1991 when SoundScan was launched, which of course took the place of the manual record store and radio reports. Um, and then the charts began reflecting what those, if you worked at a record store or were in the business, kind of already knew, which was country and rap sold much better than the charts had previously reflected. What have you learned about genres and moods with your work at everynoise.com and Spotify? 
the so the, the sound scan is like a, a a turning point in the the history of accountability in the music industry, and a lot of people have have written about that. But the thing that there was a bad thing that happened too, not ex- specifically as a result of sound scan, but it. it plays into then what, what we mean by genres, which is in the early, in the days before SoundScan, the Billboard genre charts were uh, were done by calling different record stores. In the days when you called a record store and asked them how many copies of an album that you sold, the Billboard country chart was done by calling country record stores and country radio stations. And so that's goofy and and you know, from a data point of view, undisciplined. But it meant that those charts were polling a different audience. And the Billboard genre charts today are not doing that. Like they're all based on the same audience, but then you just you just make a big chart. And then for the country chart, you cross off the things that are not country. And this is how you get a dilemma around Old Town Road where you have to make a decision about whether it's a country song or not because the data is all the same. And the the old style of chart actually becomes possible again in the streaming era because you can identify audiences. So when when people were arguing about Old Town Road, I'm like, well, I could answer this question because I have all this data. So I can I can find the country audience. I can find the hip hop audience. I can find the pop audience. I can see that yes, all those audiences are well aware of Old Town Road. Like 80% of each of audiences has heard it at least once. But it's not getting traction with country audiences. It is getting traction with pop, with huge traction with pop audiences, pretty good traction with hip hop audiences. So Billboard was in a situation where they had to have some person make a policy decision about whether Old Town Road was a country song, whereas the country audience had already decided that it wasn't. And thinking about genres, not just as audiences, but then as communities, of audience and artists, and almost all genres are some combination of those, although sometimes it's just one or the other. And usually those genres have some musicological parameters to them, but also not always. And usually there's some cultural thing, but not always. So like Romanian hip hop has all these things, like the hip hop part of it means something. The Romanian part of it means something very definite although it could be Romanian language versus Romanian nationality. There are a bunch of artists making it that are very clear that they are, they might say, I'm, I make hip hop. Oh, and I'm Romanian, but we know what they mean, that that's a Romanian hip hop scene. And the Romanian hip hop, hip hop scene has a Romanian hip hop audience that goes with it. But once you think about genre as a community, that's what makes it possible for there to be 6,000 of them. So, you know, when people see every noise at once, first, sometimes there's just incomprehension. Like, I thought there were like eight genres. Like, what, what is this? And a- after a while, if you start reading the names, you go, oh, okay. This, this is not a genre list like classical ragtime rock reggae this is this is something else and at first you're like oh you're just combining like every country with every form and then after a while you're like oh no i see it's not that either it's like it's a lot more than that and at one point i tried to make a list not just of the genres but the kinds of genres and that list was ridiculously long too it's like some of them are historical some of them are regional some of them have to do with particular instruments. Some of them have to do with particular lyric concerns, like vegan straight edge is a thing that I didn't make up. It was a scene. (laughs) It has bands, it has an audience and the in out, you know, definer there, straight edge is a thing too, but the veganness, like that was a thing. Like there was a bunch of bands that said, all right, our it's important to us that the extrapolation of the principles involved in hardcore, the music taken into the rest of my life implies not eating meat. That, that was a thing. There was a scene there. We could find it. We could, we could find you music in it. 
So that was the that was the key for me in understanding genre, which I didn't begin with. Like I started the genre exercise because it was the Echo Nest and people wanted us to sell them genre radio and we didn't have it. So and we'd promised it to somebody a few days later. So we had to like quickly make one. And then it it became an obsession because that was the easy, that was the way I could understand to try to model all the world's listening in a way that could then benefit the world and those listeners. Because if you make, if you try to make a taxonomy, like you just start at the beginning and make a taxonomy of genres, you can make a hundred or 200. And then you're like, ah, I must've gotten all the important ones here, but it's the wrong mindset because everybody's music is important to them. And so Roanoke, Virginia, indie music if you live in Roanoke, Virginia, it's just like, that's music. That's local music. If you're in Limpopo in South Africa, that's exotic foreign music that you probably don't care if you ever discover or not. Whereas Sepeti wedding music, if you're in Limpopo, is the stuff that you hear all the time. That's just normal music, normal local music. And the people in Roanoke maybe never care about it. Although both of them are awesome and both audiences would care potentially if they knew about each other. So as we, as we wind this down, um, can you give us sort of an update on every Um, I read your note, uh, on the site and we read it on the podcast last week. Any updates, anything going on with every The, in the genre map itself, I don't quite have the data access to, to update. So that's sort of sad, but also, it's 6,200 genres. Like the, that's, an, that's, that's plenty. Like you and I, the, the three of us will all be dead long before we had time to, to explore all of that stuff. So it's fine. The, the, the thing that is, that I miss for myself is new release. There's data about new releases. Yeah. And I've, I've, I have a new version of, of new releases by genre, which is my old, the thing that I used to do at Spotify and it, it uses the public API and it, it sort of works like the, the API doesn't quite give us enough data to do it efficiently. So you have to jump through some hoops. In this case, you have to sign up for your own API key because if I tried to supply everybody with it, the rate limits, I'd, I'd hit the rate limits instantly and it, it would fall apart. But if you are willing to sign up for an API key, so you get your own rate limits, it works. So I'm, I'm, I'm not giving up. I'm still, uh, still officially the site is, it's, it's, it's paused. But the more things I can f- figure out how to build in a decentralized way and the more pressure we collectively can put on the services collectively to open up or to give us better tools, then the more hope there is that we can revive some of those, those functions eventually. So that's my, yeah, hope. I hope so. I hope yeah. so. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Glenn. Love the sure. book. Um, hope to talk to you again, but uh, keep up the great work. Thanks. You've been listening to Your Morning Coffee, the weekly music news program for the new music business. Join Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchard next time for the digital music news you need to know.